From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They called me Ben. We're joined with our guest super producer, Max the Freight Train Williams. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Calendars are made up, but Happy New Year, fellow conspiracy realist. That's right. Through the magic of editing and post-production, this is the last episode. Uh, the three of us will be recording together in 2023. Remember... Just because a calendar flips a page, it doesn't mean the world suddenly stops. That's why tonight's episode is about a growing global concern that we learned about uh, several months ago and have been keeping an eye on. Uh, why are world powers, multiple world powers, accusing the nation of India of running assassination rings? And I think, uh, I think a fellow conspiracy realist of ours deserves a shout out. Oh, yeah. Big shout out to Headmaster who called in back in mid-August of this year and uh, talked to us about the assassination of a guy named Hardeep Nijar that we're going to talk about today. And that was a serious rabbit hole, Headmaster, that we went down uh, that has now led to new developments that this is the reason why we're covering it today in a full episode. Here are the facts. Folks, as we have noted in the past, India is huge. Check out our episode on the line of actual control for a brief look at just the the amazing, deep, rich history of India and all the misconceptions that the West often carries about this beautiful country. Uh, it's huge, maybe not in terms of uh, geographical size, but it is absolutely huge in terms of the number of people who live there. There are so many people living in India. Dense, <laughs> dense AF uh, with over 1.4 billion people occupying only 3.3 million square kilometers or 1,269,345 square miles. Uh, it is the world's second largest population jammed into only the seventh largest country. That's some mind blowing maths right there. Just by way of comparison, the United States is around 9 million square kilometers or 3,618, 783 square miles. Thank you, Ben, for the conversions here. Uh, and only has a population of around 3.3 million. Oh, and, and you're right. Off mic, uh, Matt, credit where it's due. You raised an excellent point. Uh, India is technically neck and neck for with China for the largest world population and i believe they were projected in 2023 to have a slight overtake in china but i don't know whether that has been officially confirmed or whether we're still playing the estimates game but uh it's no probably estimates i've just got it right because th i doubt there was some kind of census that happened this year it's you know? tough to count a lot of people and also uh Noel, shout out for that comparison because that comparison is quite clever. It does hold. We're talking about not the not just the land, but the amount of people. I had, and this may be controversial, but um, a lot of my friends who live in India or are part of the Indian diaspora who have talked to me about this, uh, more than one person has told me the biggest difference in India uh, versus America that they see in terms of people uh, is that Wherever they go, they're just a bunch of people. Makes sense. But Ben, uh, Matt, why is all this important for the topic of this evening's story? Well, I would say I would just say it's because India, like the United States, has a bunch of states within it. Right. It's not just one government, one power. It is. It's like the United States where there is one government right in Washington that is like the federal government, but each state within India also has its own governing powers, and a lot of the different states and regions have their own wants and needs that may be a little different from what the entirety of India or the federal government wants. Wouldn't you say almost more so even than the way our state governments work? Like the, the, the identity of the states within India are more pronounced perhaps even than here in the United States? That's a bit of a diff. I mean, that's a bit of a difficult, I think, comparison. I don't, I don't know whether 
we could say that authoritatively because we have not lived in India. Um, but but it's definitely true that we we have to understand, regardless of how it may be portrayed in the news in the West, the nation of India is far from a monolith. Twenty eight states, eight eight union territories, these literal billions of people obviously don't agree on everything. And there are a lot of fractures, internal um, instabilities with the government and the culture, tons of dissenting voices, to your point, Matt, contradictory aims, secessionist parties, which do occur in uh, the U.S. as well. (laughs) The U.S., of course, has a vested interest in not only containing secessionist parties, but making sure they don't get too much of a public platform. Oh, I completely agree. I think, well, see, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but this is the way I'm viewing it. In the U.S., I'm often seeing those, like, we need to split Texas off from the United States, or we should split, you know, California off and make it a a separate region or a separate country. Um, Those are often, at least from my view, not religiously motivated, right? In in the case of India, I think one of the major issues we're dealing with here is the state of Punjab, right? Mm-hmm. That that there are, there are many people who have formed movements to at least to try and separate the state of Punjab off from India to create its own state. And it's religious, it's based on religion, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and religion in this case uh, could be considered such a close Venn diagram with culture that the Mm. two indeed may be inseparable. We also have to remember that unlike the United States, the nation of India did experience a partition in 1947. The dissolution of the British Raj led to uh, Pakistan and India, and they have been beefed up ever since with one of the most dramatic border openings and crossings that occurs today. Check it out in person if you get a chance to see it. If not, go to YouTube. It's worth it. I think that's maybe where my perception of the very strong identities of the various Indian states comes from, is just that there are these different religions, maybe in a way that isn't quite something we're used to here in the United States. You know, um, it, it's a very important part of these individual you know, parts of the country more so, I think, than we have here, where there maybe aren't quite as many options in terms of like varying state to state. Yeah. And look, the every country is its own story, right? <laughs> Just like every person, but on a macro cosmic or macro polar scale. And India, like China, is struggling continually to maintain domestic unity. To your question, uh, Noel, I think it would be. I think it's fair to point out that just the discrepancy between population size is a huge factor in this. Uh, And there's also, of course, the shadow of colonialism. A bunch of different empires that existed were all grouped together by the British. And they said, "Okay, now this is India. And look, we... I feel like we have to say it for the fellow policy wonks in the crowd, but... The fact that India, China, and to another degree, probably pretty soon, the U.S. struggle to maintain domestic unity, uh, it, it is a known thing. It's led to a running dark joke <laughs> in academia where we love dark jokes. Uh, you'll hear the statement that India is the world's largest democracy. That is true. You will also hear the statement that Because it's the world's largest democracy, it is effectively the best argument against the idea of democracy. (laughs) That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to get too deep into it, guys. The discussions we've had in the past about governments and the way they function and how that changes as you increase in area and population, right? Like we're talking about... um, huge conquering armies that would move through when there was an empire, you know, in ages past and how difficult it was to do that very thing, right? To and basically engulf entire cultures and populations into your new thing that you're introducing to them and then maintain control in that region while you still run your thing at your capital and all your major industrial areas, or I guess not industrial then, just the places where you make money. 
Um, and then trying to get everybody to agree that this is how life should be and these are the rules we should all live by. That sounds insane when you say it out loud. <laughs> well, yeah, it does. And it, it does sound conspiratorial because it is like the reason there are so many problems in a lot of African countries is because European powers purposely sowed chaos. They put different um communities that existed for thousands of years together and at the same time against one another. So as strange as it does sound to say out loud, certain powerful forces profit from internal dissent, from chaos, so long as they can ultimately control that chaos. And that leads to a lot of, uh, you know, immortal technique, not for nothing, is correct when he says, uh, and beat me here, Max, you f the Middle East and gave birth to a demon like that. He's referring to that practice of sowing chaos and forcing uh, domestic, like forcing insurmountable domestic tensions. And look, you're right. That That is a rabbit hole, isn't it? Uh, it is because <laughs> it applies to South America, Latin America, sure. the Caribbean, like Name everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Southeast Asia as mm -hmm. well. Like, so India also has plenty of external struggles because India is a huge deal, not just in terms of people power. It's got a growing rivalry with China because they're two very powerful neighbors that live right next door to each other. Uh, it's got geopolitical power grabs going on, economic activity, on the ground skirmishes. Please, please, please. The name sounds boring, but check out the episode on the line of actual control. It does matter, and it is frightening. And they're getting into the space game, too, right? <laughs> With, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, just becoming a, a super uh, player in, in technology and innovation, um, as well as ex be really, truly beginning to have some big uh, 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 success in exporting what had typically been more of a regional thing um, with Bollywood films mm. like RRR, uh, mm -hmm. I believe. Won the Oscar for best song, which is embarrassing. Frankly, that movie deserved. <laughs> it's a great Oscar, film. I could it's imagine. A great film. I really Absolutely incredible. But you know, typically Bollywood films have been more a, a, a thing that people that are from that community who maybe live in the United States would be more familiar with. And in the area that I live, there's a, a mall called the South DeKalb Mall that uh, shows Bollywood movies on the regular. But there is a very large population of of Indian um, people who live in that part part of town. Um, but yeah, RRR was absolutely kind of an example of that really breaking through into the mainstream. Could make a similar comparison to K-pop. Oh yeah. Just saw uh, some K-pop group. I couldn't tell you what it was at the Jingle Ball. It was great though. It was amazing. Uh, but with, with India, they're doing the things that we've talked about in the past about how you exert external control as a country, right? One of those main things is exporting your culture. Right, Ben? That's, I think, something that we've talked about in the past. That's what they're doing. I just want to make sure we remember India had that successful lunar mission when mm -hmm. Russia's mission failed very mm -hmm. recently. Um, so that is, a again, a major step. One, the, the uh, it's not landing human beings on the moon the way the U.S. did and had that big global hurrah moment, I guess, or whatever not you call it. Not because it is easy, but <laughs> because it is hard. It, it wasn't that, but it was still a successful <laughs> lunar mission, right? right? And that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, and the the it speaks to um, it speaks to India's growing role as a tech giant. And as, uh, to be honest, as an expansionist power, mm -hmm. expansionist power carries some mean connotations, but we don't mean those mean connotations. Uh, it these, does mean they don't want to give away parts of themselves, right? Right. Well, who does? <laughs> Nobody's yeah. real. Countries historically don't have uh, consensual fire sales on territory, right? Um, but there is something, there's a very exciting thing we're going to get to in 2024 uh, about the land that nobody wants, even now in this human crowded world. Terra nullius, I believe it's called. Oh. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. I don't know about this. Is it just yeah. a dead zone or something? Several, well, it's several, um, several, some of them are dead zones, like desert stuff with no arable land. And then some of them are areas where logistics of infrastructure are tricky. And then some of them are just 
land as leverage, land as pawns in larger negotiations. And speaking of larger negotiations, this is what we're setting up here. Uh, we know we know that India is modernizing. And it is a brilliant, beautiful country. Like any other country, it is imperfect, but it is becoming a more powerful force on the world stage. And as such, naturally, it will seek recognition in the global order. Getting that recognition, it's like getting your own country. It's a tricky endeavor, somewhere between an art and a science. There's no real playbook on how to do this. And because there's no real playbook, every single country you can think of that you might think of as a global player, no exceptions, no hyperbole. Every single one has done some incredibly horrific, sketchy stuff in the pursuit of that power. Shout out to Chinese repression of domestic rights and communities, which continues today. Uh, we might not get into, we might not pass customs for some of the episodes we've recorded in that regard. Uh, shout out to CIA led coups from the U.S. 1954, Guatemala, we see you. Uh, and then the previously mentioned European colonialism. The question becomes, how far will India go to maintain its domestic status quo, to quell dissent, and to further expand, to seek power? According to the U.S., Canada, and members of the very scary global intelligence community, this country is literally killing people, not just on Indian soil, but across the planet. What are we talking about? Well, we got black bag. This is the end of the episode. This is the end of the show. We're not even doing ad breaks. It's we're over. telling the we're telling you this from the bag itself. <laughs> from the bag. We're reporting live from the bag. Kidding, no, we'll we'll keep going until we get shut down, but we'll pause for an ad break, hopefully from the India Tourism Board. <laughs> Here's where it gets crazy. So when we're when we're talking about this stuff and potentially a country assassinating people, uh, I think just let's quickly make a distinction there because we we're going to explore whether or not this was some kind of uh, the CIA like assassination, like something that an internal organization or governmental organization in India is carrying out assassinations with operatives that they basically control, right? And run and pay, or is it some kind of cell within one of those organizations, like a break off group from one of those, or is it an independent thing being carried out from the state of India? These are all big questions that we're going to be looking at. Cause I think this, that's a big deal, right? If it's a CIA in the U.S., at least, if it's a CIA-sponsored assassination, that's very different from, uh, let's say, an individual business person that hired an assassin, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just so. And we are going to have to dive into those possibilities listed there. The accusations of assassination, of conspiracy, they're not coming from lone gunman-esque wing nuts posting on 4chan. And uh, I'm, I'm just putting that in there as a shout out to X-Files. I recently rewatched some of those older episodes. And the ones that aren't tech-centric episodes hold up very well. The oh, ones yeah. that are tech-centric, you know, They've got their issues. Don't don't one of you guys or both maybe have a copy of that poster that uh, a listener made where we were superimposed. Aaron Cooper onto the lone gunman. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, there she goes. There, there used to be one right there, but it's oh, not okay. there anymore. Yeah, I've oh, got one. Right there. Okay. And thank you, Coop. If you're if you're hearing that, I hope you're well. <laughs> and, and great work as always. He's uh, he's a legend in the game. So these aren't just you know. Reddit lore, 4chan type folks saying this, and they're not a bunch of Charlie Days putting red string together in a mailroom corkboard. One of the first accusations that goes public is from the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. It's uh, September 18th, just um, just a few, a few months ago, back in 2023. Trudeau says there are credible allegations that agents of the Indian government carried out an assassination and they killed a Canadian national, Hardeep Singh Nijar, uh, who we mentioned at the top here, a prominent Sikh activist. He was shot dead outside of a temple in Surrey, British Columbia, just a month before that announcement, June 18th, 2023. And the timing here is important because Pretty quickly after the murder or after the body is found, the leader of Canada is saying, we know who did it. 
And it's not just some dude. It's some dude on or dudes on the order of a foreign power. Well, and and act, I, I think the timing is the most important thing, Ben, because it like three months is a pretty good amount of time for whatever, you know, Canadian intelligence organization to do their thing and find out everything they can and then come back with a report to the, to then have, you know, the prime minister go, oh, wow. I need to say something about this. And I mean, three months is, exa- it's just perfect. I think for, for it to actually be an investigation and not just a prime minister coming out for some kind of geopolitical reasons, making this kind of accusation, which I don't think he would do anyway. Right. It, there must be sand to it for him to come out on the world stage and say something like this. Or at least he thought there was sand. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, the thing is a lot of genuine conspiracies have boring bureaucracy to them. So maybe they had like a net 90 day invoice and they had to make sure the invoice got fulfilled. And then they're like, Oh, okay. They did do it. So the, uh, the, that is a joke for like two people in an accounting department, but let's, let's talk about how they found him. How did, how did he die? So law enforcement found that uh, Nijar in his truck parked outside of the guru Nanak Sikh Gudwara temple uh, had died from apparent gunshot wounds. Uh, and Najjar was the president of that very same temple, which is located in Surrey, British Columbia. Um, Najjar was a Canadian national, but he was involved in uh, a lot of Sikh activist uh, activity. And he was also a secessionist who advocated for the creation of a separate country for Sikhs, um, independent from India itself in the current state of Punjab. Um, and this proposed state would have been called Khalistan. Yes. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so he he was killed. He was shot like outside work, basically, where were he and which is, you know, could be anything. Right. Maybe he had an enemy. Nobody knew about maybe, maybe. it was local politics. Exactly. You know, or what it could have been. There's so many reasons. Maybe it was a robbery. Exactly. Um, so that that is, I think, the first thing we need to think about. The other thing is uh, Surrey. BC or British Columbia is just it's it's like a suburb of Vancouver, right? So just north of the northwest border of Washington State and Canada there. Um, so again, pretty close to US soil. And and not that has that has anything to do with it, but uh Nijar had his own thing going on there, but he was also apparently, at least according to the Indian government, he was really influential in the stuff Noel was just talking about there about um wanting wanting the Punjab state to secede, right? Like according to the Indian government, he was a big player doing all kinds of crazy stuff on Indian soil, even though he's out in Canada. Right. He was working remotely, mm-hmm. but with terrorism is the idea. And it's because of his affiliation with the Khalistan Tiger Force, which is a militant, uh, militant secessionist group. That part is inarguable. That is true. But he was also wanted actively by the Indian government. And uh, we'll get to the Indian perspective in a minute, but the Indian government had for years and years and years said, this guy and these following guys are terrorists. They are a danger to the national security of our country. Why on earth are you giving them a free pass? Like in, in their minds, it's similar to, you know, um, it's similar to if bin Laden was living in Germany and running a mosque and you wrote to uh, you wrote to Merkel or something repeatedly and said, hey, this guy is responsible for hundreds of deaths. Go get him. And then they said, oh, well, you know, noted. I hear you. Uh, and then didn't do anything. So Indian, the Indian government was very frustrated with this for quite some time leading up to the murder, particularly something called their research and analysis wing. That yeah. is raw. It's not a wrestling term. India is raw. It, raw is <laughs> India's external intelligence agency. Raw yeah. dog in it. Well, and they were creating all of these things called FIRs, 
from, I mean, we're talking like 2018, 2020, they were creating their first information reports is what they were creating. That's what they call them. And they were reports about all kinds of activities. Um, most of it was like him having surveillance done on particular like government groups or military groups. And they believed that he was planning, Nijar was planning an attack of some sort on one of those government groups. Right. And this is based on uh, the actions of the Khalistan separatist movement in the 80s and 90s, mm -hmm. in which thousands of people did die. There were yep. terrorist attacks. Uh, and Nijar had also been warned just, by... Just, I'm sorry, quick question. Right, Khalistan, yeah, does, does that exist? Or is no. this just a conceptual thing? Yeah, right. I, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, so he had also been warned by uh, the intelligence community of Canada several times officially. They said, look, there are active death threats against you. He was aware of this and he, he, uh, he had also been he had also been given the chance to respond to accusations of the Indian government. He spoke to Canadian press and he said, look, I am not doing these things. Like, yes, I am an activist for Sikh rights. Yes, I do believe that the Sikh people deserve a homeland, a state of their own, but I'm not ordering terrorist attacks. I am not a, the monster here. I'm not the bad guy. But it is crazy because then as an observer, everybody else on the planet has to go, okay, well, I either uh, believe him in his words and that he's telling the truth, or I believe the Indian government and what they're saying and that they're telling the truth. And it, it just, it puts, I think it puts the every third party that is not either that huge organization and state government or an individual man. Um, you just have to kind of decide what you believe. Two categorical statements that contradict one another. Yeah. Yeah. There's not really a, a third way. Well, and speaking of statements contradicting one another, did the, believe the Indian government, uh, you know, vehemently denied those allegations uh, leveled by Trudeau, um, calling them absurd, um, basically chalking them up to some sort of political agenda, perhaps a smear campaign of some sort. And we'll get back to the statements a bit later. Uh, but why don't we continue on with uh, the history and the timeline? Yeah, so the World Sikh Organization of Canada is one of the first groups to say, don't believe the stories. Even before Trudeau makes a statement, they say he was assassinated. Nijar was assassinated by the nation of India upon their orders. And they said, what's more, he's only one of several people who were killed. And there, there's some, some stuff we talked about briefly off air. We'd love your opinions, fellow conspiracy realists. The WSO, World Sikh Organization, says that over the past few months leading up to Najjar's murder, other pro Khalistan activists have been murdered or died in sub suspicious circumstances. Uh, and again, pardon our pronunciations here, folks. We are not native speakers. Uh, they mentioned people like uh, Paramajit Singh Panjwar uh, over in Pakistan, who was shot by two gunmen on a morning walk. And then and he, uh, that guy was uh, allegedly associated with the Khalistan Commando Force, which was right. which India, at least the government of India, categorizes as a terrorist, terrorist organization. organization. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're noticing here, folks, is something that you can see all the world round. One country may designate something a terrorist organization with just cause, with provable murders and acts of chaos, but other countries don't agree, right? Yeah. Oh, and that organization believes it is a liberating force of some kind fighting for good. Freedom fighters, terrorists, what's your perspective? Yeah. And the the other one that's a little more controversial is Avtar Singh Khanda in Britain. Avtar Singh Khanda is the death in what they call mysterious circumstances. He's thirteen or he's thirty five in June of twenty twenty three, and he dies uh, following a diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia. Which, if that is an assassination, does not seem like a very straightforward way to murder someone. It's a long game. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, in the, the, I mean, impossible. <laughs> Let's just be well, real. Uh, I mean, right. No. I mean, if you could touch the hospital, if they're in a hospital at that point. I, yeah, it depends on whether you could or not. fake the, the diagnosis to, well, to have it be a cover story or a cover. You could just right. have someone who's not really um, 
<laughs> who's who, you could have someone who works at the hospital do some shenanigans. Yeah, be, that's if what I he's, mean by touch it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. If he's in the hospital for that the cancer of the blood, uh, he and undergoing treatment, right? You could kill him in another way. The uh, the police there in Birmingham, where he was when he died, are not investigating it because they're like, no, nah, this is not suspicious. We're good to go. But that guy, again, just to keep adding this, uh, called himself, at least referred to himself as the chief of the Khalistan Liberation Force, another group designated as terrorist organization. So you can see already the roots of the Khalistan movement are deep. They are multipolar, right? And they have a lot of support amid the diaspora. Uh, now, having support amid a diaspora does not mean everybody who wants a Khalistan around is a terrorist. Far from it. There are people who are saying, hey, why can't we have our thing too? You know, And that's a very human question. The history also goes deeper because if you look at India's Punjab state, one of the larger states, the 28 states of India, then you see that it is majority Sikh. Just barely. It's about 58% Sikh, uh, 39% Hindu, self-reporting. And that's why there was this violent Khalistan movement there, or this uh, series of, honestly, just objectively horrific attacks. And today, the movement's most vocal advocates are Punjabi diaspora. And India has, again, complained often, repeatedly, before and after those events of the 80s and 90s, they have complained about activities of what they say are Sikh hardliners. And they, they say, look, you know, you guys might not be reporting it in the Western news, but these folks are planning horrible, horrible things, bombings of civilians, right? Airports, hospitals, uh, bombing airplanes, and so on. And in March, Indian authorities called Canada's top diplomat in the country because Sikh protesters were gathered outside India's diplomatic mission in Canada. So it goes, it goes much deeper than, um, than one person dead in a pickup truck, right? And then there were more accusations, right? Maybe there's, maybe there's fog of war, smoke and mirrors, pomp and circumstance. Maybe Trudeau is being told to say these things for some ulterior motive. Maybe it's just one guy's allegations, one whistle in the dark. Uh, as you mentioned previously, th uh, the Indian government responded, said this stuff is politically motivated. It's absurd. So they're saying there's an ulterior motive. But if we continue the timeline, we'll see that Canada, when they go public with these claims, everything goes wrong with their relationship. They're expelling diplomats left and right, uh, some of the trade deal stuff they were working on, which doesn't get widely reported, that hits a roadblock. And then a bombshell drops in November. Uncle Sam tries to have an off the books conversation and gets caught by the media. So the United States actually claims that they've discovered a very similar plan to kill another activist that was uh, stopped, um, a dual U.S.-Canadian citizen by the name of Gurpatwant Singh Panun, uh, who very similarly to uh, Nijar um, was a prominent Sikh separatist. Um, and the U.S. government claims that an Indian government official paid $100,000 for a plot to assassinate Panun. Doesn't that seem a little... A little uh, uh, like 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 a bit of a deal, hundred k, or is that uh, oh, standard? That's a uh, lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot. It was a lot of money, but to kill somebody, I thought we were thinking maybe uh, upwards of that. But maybe well, I don't. I don't know what the going rate is for an assassination these days. Well, it, it well, that sounds weird. It's like I know I I don't want to seem like I know too much about this, or I'm speaking with too much authority. I have seen allegations in uh, the news for murder for hire plots. That range from five thousand dollars to you know ten, fifteen, Jeez. twenty five thousand dollars. This is actually okay. really high okay. compared to what. Yeah, well, that's again, really, that's very interesting and helpful. But if it's at a government level, that you know those are the allegations that somehow at a government level there was going to be a hundred thousand dollars procured procured to pay somebody to pull off a high level assassination. It's high level it's and also, likely for for this rate, you'd be getting a real pro. 
It's also the smallest amount of money that sounds like a lot of money. Exactly. That's true. That exactly. Is, that is true. That it's, is exactly that's right. like so when when this kind of stuff happens, if there the if there is a a government tie here, right? If you follow the money, then what this would indicate is it's coming from a slush fund, it's coming from some kind of thing that gets whoosh, whoosh, misallocated. In the budget, right? Uh, and who knows? Maybe they said, "Look, um, send us an invoice for a hundred grand. It's a net ninety day turnaround, uh, so you'll, yeah. you'll get the money at that point." But or again, if you the, just had a high enough level person with enough money, right? You could work that money through and wouldn't have to touch government ever. Or if there was somebody who was working with you, middlemanning it through the government, then they give you three hundred thousand dollars, right? And you're a criminal, so a criminals like high profit margins, right? Whether they're on Wall Street or uh, in the back streets of your city, criminals like high profit margins. So we just know that Uncle Sam is claiming this. Yep. And they're not saying approximately, they're saying exactly. And when they say this, this is a, the important part, they are not initially public about these claims. The, U, the world only knows that the U.S. said this because of some badass journalists uh, led by the Financial Times, uh, true investigative journalist. Uh, if you, look, your local investigative journalist is almost certainly underpaid, is almost certainly unappreciated. So next time you hang out with them, you should pay for the coffee. Just to, just to help them out, right? And uh, well, you know, in cases like this, they're they're putting themselves in harm's way, oftentimes, you know, or in in, in danger of uh, retribution. Yeah, and and also be careful of hanging out with journalists, and be careful if you're a journalist. Well, we just read a story and, and listened to uh, some reporting about Pegasus being on reporters' phones in several countries, like major newspapers. It's and been known. It's been I know, like but it, like yeah. But just the infectious nature of being somebody that likes to bring truth out into the world to the light, uh, it seems it seems like a dangerous time. That's all. Well, according circles. to several reviews, we're disinfo, so I think we're fine. Okay, no, not <laughs> us. I'm not worried about us. I mean, an actual investigative journalist. <laughs> oh, geez. So, uh, so the White House had to respond once uh, Financial Times, in a in a multi partner investigation, leaked this. What they said off the record is. They told the Indian government, we have information that links you to a attempt to murder a dual U.S. Canadian citizen. It's not even an Indian national. Not that that should matter. We're supposed to prevent assassinations on our soil. And so when this news comes out, the White House has to say something. And it falls to another unappreciated job, having to be the spokesperson for the White House. Having to go in front of the press club. I don't, you know, I'm sure these folks get paid more than independent journalists, but boy, they have to take a lot of, you, you think the, the customer service rep at Comcast has it bad? These people have it worse. Adrian Watson is the spokesperson who takes the hit on this and says, paraphrasing here, says, okay, yes, the Financial Times is right. We did speak to officials of the Indian government about this, and they expressed surprise and concern when we told them. They're like, what? What's going on? OMG, you guys. Uh, and Watson said, we're treating this with seriousness. Uh, we're talking to the senior most levels about these attempts. And then later, we know uh, an indictment, an indictment was unsealed. Not an insealment was undicted. An indictment was unsealed in Manhattan's federal court, and it finally named some names. Uh, there's a guy named Nikhil Gupta, 52, an Indian national who had lived in India, who has been charged with murder for hire and conspiracy to commit murder for hire. In case you're wondering, we don't think he's going to be able to use that hundred grand for legal fees. No, I don't know. I do not think I, so. I don't think that loophole is still a thing. <laughs> nope. Um, just to go back to the, the just the concept of the White House coming out and having to make an official statement on this. Right. It's such uh, it's such sticky territory for them, as we've talked about in the past. And as you you may have seen in the news, the United States has really been p positioning a close relationship with India for all kinds of geopolitical reasons. Right. And well, one of the main things is that it's a partner that is right there, literally adjacent 
to Russia and China just hanging out uh, in and having them as a close ally is extremely important for so many reasons to the U.S. And then to have to come out and say, yeah, um, it does seem like the country is assassinating people like oh, over here. <clears throat> Everything's fine. I mean, it's really a weird thing. We did talk, but it was like, a, <laughs> you know, they, they said everything but um, missions, mission siloing. Right. Where you Mm -hmm. have those off the books conversations and then attempt to like make your off the book conversation the world you want it to be without without including the other people important to that conversation, which would be the people who are trying not to die, the public that is paying for your job, et cetera. India signals that they are investigating. They say, we're going to release a public statement. Don't worry. We we're we're as surprised as you. Financial Times said its sources did not say if the U.S. was um, it did not say whether the U.S. got to India or got word to India before the assassination happened. And then the assassination was abandoned because it was still just planning stages. That would or, make sense, right? If, right? if they were like, hey, we see you doing this. Mm-hmm. Don't do this. We're trying Hands to make off. other things happen. Right. <laughs> Right. We got a good thing going here, yeah. Modi. Uh, or if it was foiled by the FBI. All that the press can say for sure, all that the public can say for sure right now, is that this investigation, right, the release from the Financial Times and the, the conversation that the U.S. had with India appears to have occurred around when the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, visited Joe Biden in June of 2023. So again, at the time, they were talking about a lot of stuff. And then they had a, uh, hey, by the way, are you guys trying to kill some people? Yeah, that's exactly what it was, Ben. Hey, uh, yeah, while we grab some tea, uh, <laughs> just like, just bring it up just casually. Uh, so, okay, that Financial Times article was released... November 22nd uh, in 2023. So, yeah, it totally makes sense. Again, I'm just thinking about those timelines of investigation, right? It's exactly how long it would take, Ben, I think, from those conversations and when it would have occurred, when the amount of time it would have taken for somebody to choose to uh, release information or come forward with information for the paper to do the writing and their investigation. It's really, gosh, really interesting that that, Sorry, just the just the idea that those powerful people were together. And I always imagine I have this picture in my mind of state leaders talking to each other. And I've never actually seen it in person, like that kind of closed door, just chilling, shooting, mm. shooting the stuff, you know, with two extremely powerful people. And just how much of a dance that must be with the things that each one knows about the other one because of their various intelligence arms or whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. When when both people in conversation are lying and they both know they're lying, the content of the conversation gets very close to the truth. You know what I mean? It's it's a very strange double game. But and also these these guys are rarely alone when they're speaking. It's it's pretty extraordinary, which is why the Russian stuff is troubling. But uh <laughs> the US Russian conversations a few years back. But the um the other thing here that I'm sure you're already thinking as well, Matt, is who was this leak co-signed? Because whenever Mm. an official from the U.S. who cannot be named or is anonymous is talking to the New York Times, there is a, I would say, just spidey sense, there's a more than 50% chance that someone greenlit the leak and was like, contact our boy or contact our person, our people, and just don't put your name on it so it looks like a leak so that we can say, oh, wow, the press is really good. <laughs> and here's an inside look at the way Power the sausage move. is made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a chess move. But there's the other thing, too. Like, if this – so there are already, there's already a lot of uh, obfuscation, right? Obfuscation. Uh, we, we know that regardless of how this news got out, unlike many other homicides or attempted murders – these activities 
carry some very heavy baggage because the U.S. government is desperately working to have a bulwark or balance against China. As China continues to grow and expand, India is the number one draft pick for that. And now you get to a disturbing cost-benefit calculus. The appeal of being a citizen in any country is the idea that the government will protect you on some level. In the grand, <laughs> yeah, in the grand scheme of things, though, is a nation. How much will a nation risk for one person's life? Would a nation, any nation, risk the future of the global order for one person? Especially if some people already think that person is a terrorist. Oh, it's that greater good, man. One person doesn't mean jack. Well, well, I don't know. I th- depending on the I, person, <laughs> perhaps I suppose. But your average, you know. Citizen is kind of expendable. Well, it's, just, it's just so weird because if that person was extremely valuable for some kind of economic reason, I think that one person could be like held up, right? If oh, they no, could that, be leveraged, for sure. like Elian Gonzalez became very important because Gonzalez was able to be leveraged in the U.S. political discourse. Dude, exactly. Uh, but th- this is all just taking me back to think about how these two guys that we've talked about, Nijar, the, the person who was shot back in June, and then Panun, the person who was this murder plot was aimed at, right, that survived, didn't get killed. Back on June 21st uh, of 2023, The Wire wrote a story. And in that story, just a couple sentences here, uh, quote, Nijar was a declared terrorist in India. Wanted in several cases. He was the chief of that Tiger Force that you talked about, Ben. And he worked closely with the Sikhs for Justice leader, Panun. So it names Panun and Najjar together in the same article after Najjar gets assassinated. I just, to me, that is so interesting that these two guys, both, both targeted, and they're being talked about together in June, around the same time when this plot is probably happening, taking place against Panoon. Mm-hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. Let's pause for a word from our sponsor, and then, to be objective and fair, we're going to go to the Indian perspective. We've returned. All right, so we've talked a lot about the ins and outs of this, the questions, some of which are still going to be very difficult to answer, I think, for an interminable amount of time. The Indian government has a weird, somewhat dichotomous approach to these claims. I mean, they're not mutually exclusive. You guys tell me what you think. On the one hand, officials, high-level officials, deny any knowledge of any shenanigans. And originally, they said they were scandalized by the Canadian accusations. Absurd, politically motivated. If you have proof, show us the proof. And then that will help us help you. But on the other hand, they're saying, look, Canada, Uncle Sam, you're providing refuge for enemies of our state. We warned you repeatedly. You never, ever listened. The implication being, so what are we to do to protect our people? How far would we go? What is one life in our cost-benefit calculus or even a couple lives? I mean, I, I, I was thinking it might be helpful, like... Do we flip the players in the roles here? If we do, we see a crazy precedent because the United States can, has, and absolutely will go into a sovereign country, proactively eliminate anyone it feels is a threat past a certain threshold. And the U.S. isn't usually too quiet about it either. Guys, I... Because in order for the U.S. to actually get their hands on this person that they were investigating, uh, Gupta, the person who's charged with, you know, the murder for hire plot, didn't they use extradition and like go to another country that then cooperated with them to get the person they wanted? Yeah, he was in. uh, He's currently in the Pancrack prison, Pancrack prison in Prague. I think he's still there as of December, but. Yeah, they're going to get him. Well, yeah, and he was he was in the Czech Republic when he was arrested. So like and there they there was a bilateral treaty bet- or a, an extradition treaty between two countries to get their hands on this guy. So I don't know. That, that's just the kind of weird thing where it does feel like playing different playing with playing the same game with different rules. 
what do, what did we say earlier? The U.S. says you want the smoke. Turns out you're in the smoking section, you know, <laughs> wherever you live. And and that that still doesn't answer who actually did it. Who killed this guy in Canada? Right? Who killed Najar? Who uh, are they related to? These other deaths? Is it one entity planning these things? They successfully conspired in one case. Did they almost succeed in another? We have to say, given the historical precedent our earlier series on targeted killings and assassinations, we can walk through some hypothetical possibilities and maybe the plausibility. Number one, fair question. What if the Indian government is aware of this at the top level and does not care? That's very unlikely. That's not how black ops work. I mean, look at your, wherever you live, however you feel about your leaders and politicians. If you don't live in Russia, then civilian and political leadership has a series of firewalls between these activities. This is why, like, this is why when your government, any government gets up to shenanigans, the leaders of that organization can technically be telling the truth when they say, well, holy cow, man, I didn't know that happened either. That's mm-hmm. crazy. Indeed. Uh, another option is that a faction of the Indian intelligence community may have uh, triggered, perhaps a poor choice of words, this, or uh, knew something was coming and uh, helpfully kind of turned away um, to, whoop, I don't know to see here, um, or provided some kind of uh, perhaps even help. Uh, this is both plausible and plausible. Um, we can call it plausible because the intelligence communities often act with this siloed kind of level of autonomy that verges on, like you were saying earlier, playing by a different set of rules. Mm, According to them, you know, that's business as usual, but to the outside, it could appear to be criminal activities, right? Yeah. So, okay. Forgive me here, bro. In, in my mind, if, if this person was targeted, right? from the top levels of an intelligence community, wouldn't that assignment basically go to one or two people? Or, you know? Yes. Yeah. It would go to typically what would happen is you want to be very buttoned up and close to the chest. So it would go to one or two people. And then from there, maybe only one person knows who gets the contract or you know the subcontract et cetera et cetera what you want is as many shells yeah as as ideally you want as many shells as possible but really every one of those every new piece you add presents countless vulnerabilities or possibilities for exposure so you want to keep it like quiet the best secret is the secret no one knows, right? So, I mean, it, it's a, there's another badger in the bag, though, here, Matt, which is this murder, or we have to say it in the interest of fairness, um, before we get to the really juicy stuff. Th- this murder, other mysterious deaths, attempted murder, there is the possibility that they're all unrelated. You know, and these people caring uh, and participating in the movement for Sikh rights and independence is a coincidence. That is highly unlikely. That is utterly impossible. Highly unlikely is far too kind because of the disturbing thing the badger just mentioned. Five Eyes. Five Eyes is in the mix. Five Eyes is how the U.S. and Canada know what they know. I guarantee it. Let's uh, just recap everybody on Five Eyes. That's the United States, Canada, m- not Mexico. United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. New Zealand. The, and they all share intelligence. Uh, the extent to which they share 100% of intelligence, we're unsure. Which players give 85%? Which ones give 25%? Who knows? <laughs> they all. I think they all sort of... Share choice pieces of the puzzle when convenient for them. Yeah, I think that's exactly how to do it. Yep. Some uh, light reading on the subject can be found in the Stuff They Don't Want You to Know book. Illustrated by the one and only Admiral Turbo, Nick Indeed. Benson. Uh, and so, yeah, Five Eyes is scary, folks. Uh, does your religious, political, demographic stuff 
uh, your ideologies of choice, they do not matter. This is a very, this is like the closest version to Big Brother in real life in terms of public, uh, public statecraft, right? Uh, private industries may be up to some other stuff, but Five Eyes touches them too. It is simply reality. Uh, so they, we know Five Eyes is involved because an unnamed Canadian official said, we drew our conclusions based on intel provided by a major ally, a member of the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Alliance. Like, yeah. uh, <laughs> yep, checks out. Checks out, because what can't those guys touch, you know, um, other than firewalled, uh, other than firewalled hardware for like Iranian nuclear capabilities? Yeah, but OK, so it makes me wonder if there are actually uh, if there was an agent or two or actual human assets from one of these Five Eyes organizations in the Czech Republic checking up on Gupta before he was arrested. Which it always I, I I don't know I always wonder about not jurisdiction that's not the right word for it but just operating in another country that has an extradition treaty signed with the U S and they're you know investigating a murder a, a murder for hire plot inside the United States in New York City so they just go to the Czech Republic and they like watch a person and then share some intel but like it could have been any it could have been any of the major Five Eyes countries. That was actually that actually had agents there looking at, so. which also gives them another version of plausible deniability, yeah. right? It could have be one of the five. So now we're playing the game of Clue, right? Uh, so the it's it's strange too because Canada says that they caught they caught info from uh from a member of the uh, Indian diplomacy outfit who was using a government phone to plan some of this, which is just egregious. And wow. I, I don't know, man, I don't, I don't buy that. Honestly, that's way too sloppy for a professional. I think. Oh, yeah. That's hard to imagine. Un unless they don't usually do that kind of thing and were instructed to somehow, or were urged to, I don't know. And they didn't know what they were doing, but that doesn't, I, that doesn't feel, that doesn't it feel feels right weird. to me. It feels like uh, it feels like something you would see on HBO. I mean, maybe they just had really bad code phrases too. Maybe they were just like, "Mr. Gupta, I hear you paint houses." You know, <laughs> like I <laughs> like that's I I don't know. It seems weird. I mean, there are other possibilities not proven. What if there's a criminal syndicate or something on the wrong side of the law, like the mob here in the U.S. in India, and they're working independently? Because they uh, they happen to have uh, aligning interest, right? They don't want the uh, the Khalistan to exist for reasons of their own, or maybe there's money involved. I mean, the U.S. historically doesn't mind working with the mob or warlords. The Japanese government has worked with the yakuza before, like it. Well, if you it believe happens. the stories about the MLK assassination, the U.S. government worked with like small organized, small town organized crime mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in order to carry out that assassination. And they did it with the approval of larger organized crime associates. And the thing is, the smaller you go, the less you have to pay as well. Just, so, I don't know. Ugh. It's, it's crazy. I mean, there's also, okay, the last one. What if a third party threw some chaos into the dance, you know, because both Canada and the U S are extremely focused on improving relations with India before this string of deaths from a cost benefit perspective. If you wanted that not to happen, this would be a very cost effective asymmetrical way of stopping it. So just sowing some chaos, you know, mm -hmm. for your own financial benefit. Hey, Venezuela, you got to protect yourself from Guyana, et cetera. <laughs> Walk down the street for that one. But, uh, uh, but so Prime Minister Modi recently, as of December 20th, I think, 20th or 21st, uh, responded publicly in his first real public statements about this. He said, look, these are a few incidents. We want to maintain diplomatic ties and improve diplomatic ties between the U.S. and India. 
And also, and he spoke with the Financial Times, by the way, he said, look, if someone gives us any information, we'll definitely look into it because I don't know what's happening is the implication. I plausibly deny any activity in this regard. That could be sincere. It could be, I don't know, if you, since we're playing the paranoia game, that could also be a challenge to say, tell us how you know this. Tell us how you collect information. Can we just stop playing the paranoia game, everybody? I'm so over it. <laughs> oh. It's weird. I'm so over it. I mean, maybe Modi is over it as well. Uh, he did reiterate the claim India has made, again, continually. Uh, he said, look, this separatist violence is real. We're very concerned about terrorists and extremist groups, and they're operating with apparent impunity from the safety of other countries. Help us, please. You know, and that's... Isn't that similar to the United States uh, questioning of Pakistan? Right. And other countries that were, quote, harboring terrorists. Mm -hmm. Right. And like you're mm -hmm. either with us or you're against us. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in my mind. A false dichotomy, perhaps. Right. Like uh, or a dichotomy, at least. It reminds me of. Uh, do you remember when Pervez Musharif showed up on The Daily Show? Jon Stewart interviewed him. Yeah. It was a very weird situation. I remember yeah. reading about the production to make it happen. But I don't, I don't remember the interview at all. <laughs> I don't remember. Well, with our powers combined, because I don't remember. Uh, the, I'm sure there was a ton of weird stuff going into the production of that. But I remember the interview. I was like, either Jon Stewart is excellent at this job or Musharif is strangely charismatic. <laughs> I don't like that you're rolling with the jokes, man. I know what you did. But anyway... That's a story for another night, perhaps. We see what appears to be a genuine conspiracy here. We just don't know all the pieces. Uh, like, But like, like they say in that Tool song, we know the pieces fit, right? Um, we also know that there's no escaping the fact people are dead. Events have been set in motion. And maybe one of the best ways to end this is to to say something to the Sikh communities in the U.S. and Canada, diaspora overall, these are just regular people. They got all the joys and concerns and fears of any other civilian. And now, as a result of these things, they're wondering if their own governments will protect them should assassins come to call. And that's a horrible thing to have to wonder. I don't know. Yeah. No, it really is. It really is. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe. Maybe someone listening now knows the answer. I hope so. I hope you do, and you'll write to us. Uh, but just quickly, if you want to dig deep into this, there is there is something the Australian broadcasting company put out on September 19th last year called Canada and India have expelled each other's top diplomats in the last 24 hours. Here's why Australia is deeply concerned. To me, that is one of the strangest uh, titles for an article that I can imagine, right? The headline for an article like, okay, Canada and India are doing this thing. Here's why Australia is concerned. In my mind, I don't connect any of that stuff, but it takes us back to our discussion about five eyes, um, which is, I, I think it's worth your time to dive into that. If, if you're listening to this right now, and there's so many articles, uh, out there that you do kind of have to go back in time and build like the story as you go, if you really want to di dive deep. So I just, you know, a good place to start is probably the assassination that occurred in June of 2023, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The one, the one that was in Canada, mm -hmm. like start there, if you're going to look into this and then just kind of let it flow <laughs> and go back to the early two thousands too. Yes. With oh my uh, God. Holliston activism. Anyway, mm -hmm. Uh, five ish eyes are watching you. Ooh, ooh. They see your every move. And they might know when you email us. We can't hear, we can't wait to hear what no. you think, folks. Yeah, that's a setup. Don't say that. Actually, they will. Yeah, yeah like for real. Yeah. 
That's true. Uh, so tread lightly. Use a spoofed email account uh, and definitely uh, give yourself a fun nickname. Uh, you can also reach out to us online in other ways, uh, like social media, where we are Conspiracy Stuff on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, XFKA Twitter. Uh, Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram and Tickety Talk. Hey, you can call us just like Headmaster did back in August last year. Uh, call one eight three three S T D W Y T K. It's a voicemail system. When you call in, you'll get three minutes. Please give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your message and voice on the air. Uh, you can always just say things like, and hey, uh, don't put this part in there and then say something and then say, OK, now you can keep going here. It's actually kind of cool. Give us edit points. We'll make it work. If you don't want to do that stuff, but you still want to write to us, maybe send us links. You've got attachments, anything, pictures of your cat. We love those. Uh, we are. The folks who read every single email we get, conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Happy 2024, folks. We can't wait to hear from you. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.